Jesus was celebrating the Passover at a meal with his disciples. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and wine from the table and said, This is my body, this is my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. After the meal, Jesus and his disciples went into a nearby garden to pray. The disciples fell asleep, but Jesus continued to pray emotionally, asking God for some way out of what was about to happen, but saying that it was ultimately up to God. Just as he finished, a large crowd with swords and clubs led by Jesus' disciple Judas came and arrested Jesus. Another one of his disciples, Peter, tried to defend Jesus. He took out his sword and cut off the ear of one of the high priest's servants. But Jesus told him to put away his sword and reached out and touched the man's ear and healed him. Jesus was led away beaten and spit on by those who arrested him, and he was taken to the Roman governor, Pilate. Pilate told the crowd that he could find no real charges to bring against Jesus. But the crowd screamed out, crucify him, demanding that Jesus be executed. So Pilate handed Jesus over to be killed. When Judas saw that Jesus was going to be killed, he was filled with regret and sadness for betraying him. So he went back to the Jewish leaders, gave them their bribe money, and went out into a field and hanged himself. Jesus was crucified, nailed by his hands and feet to a wooden cross. Then, even though it was only noon, the sun stopped shining, and darkness came over the whole land. Hanging from the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Someone nearby then gave Jesus a drink by filling a sponge and lifting it up to Jesus on a long stick. After Jesus took a drink, he said, It is finished, and died. At that moment, the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook. When the guards and the others around Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified, saying, surely he was the Son of God. So good to see everybody here this morning. I am so blessed you are here today. And today we are continuing in our study on the gospel of Matthew, and we only have two more sermons after today, but today arrives at the pinnacle of the gospel, the core of all scripture, what everything has been pointing up to and changed everything after, the cross, the cross. Several years ago, I had someone that, that would pray for me on a regular basis, and it blessed me greatly. And when, when he would pray, he would always pray that God would hide me in the shadow of the cross. And at first, you know, I'm trying to play off like I was all spiritual and understood what he was saying. Like, oh, thanks for the prayer. I understood that. I, I, I didn't. And so I prayed about it, and I started thinking about it, and thinking about everything I do as a minister everything I do as a husband, everything I do as a father, as a man, as an American, as a human being, needs to be in the shadow of the cross, which means I am nothing without what Christ did on the cross. Boy, may each of us live in the shadow of the cross. We find no being, nothing we do is separate from what Christ did. That is what we are going to look at today. That is what the Apostle Paul reveals as the greatest event where nothing else matters but Christ crucified. This is what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, chapter 2. He said, Paul told the believers in Corinth, that he resolved to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
nothing else mattered. Everything in life was filtered through what Christ had done on the cross. Paul told the believers in Galatia, in Galatians 6, 14, he said, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then 1 Corinthians 1, 22 through 24, he summarizes the heart of the New Testament by saying, Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and wisdom of God. Now, some of you might be thinking, did I show up on the wrong Sunday. I thought I was here for the 4th of July, and I'm getting a Good Friday or an Easter message. And the truth is, every day we should celebrate Good Friday, we should celebrate Easter. Because nothing else matters. Everything in life needs to go through Jesus Christ, Him crucified. That's where we're arriving today. And I think it's fitting that we arrive at Matthew's gospel on the cross on the 4th of July because if ever before, now is the time our nation needs to turn to Christ crucified. They need to turn to our Savior, Lord and King because, boy, we are going the wrong direction. But for each of us personally, is our life, is our pursuits, is our hope, is Our everything lived in the shadow of the cross. Before we go any further, I'm going to pray for us. Father God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross. God, I pray through your Holy Spirit, you will open our hearts. You will open our minds through your Spirit, speaking through your Word, but also just enlightening our ability to grasp the measure the fullness of what Christ did for us on the cross. Not just understanding the physical torture he endured, but the spiritual significance of what Christ has done. And God, for those who are on that place where, yeah, they kind of believe, but uh, they kind of don't, God, I pray you will grab a hold of them. Pour out your love because it is your love that sent Jesus to die for us. I pray that they will just be, their faith will be ignited, that they will place their faith in you. For those who are here and we just go through the motions and it's so easy to lose sight of what you did 2,000 years ago on a criminal's cross, God, I pray our faith is revived. And for those who are weary, those who are just struggling, they're burdened by the weight of life, may they receive the hope, the hope that is only found in Christ. God, meet each one of us today at the cross and change us forever. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to read Matthew 27, 32, 33. Through 56. This is a large section of scripture. So if you have your Bibles, you can follow along and it'll be on the screen. But this is Matthew's account of what took place on the cross. Let's start with verse 32. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon. They forced him to carry the cross. They forced him to carry Jesus' cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him. One on his right, one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. 
In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, so from 12 noon till 3 o'clock, he was on the cross. And it says that darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama zabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he is the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, the mother of Zebedee, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. From this account and from each of the other accounts in the Gospels, there's three basic questions about the cross that we need to answer. Each of us need to be able to answer these questions because they truly reveal God's plan through Jesus Christ, who Jesus is, and how our life is forever redeemed through the Holy Son of God. The first question is this. If you have your bulletins or in your bulletins, they'll be on the screen, is being able to ask the question, how did Jesus end up dying on a Roman cross? How did he end up dying on a Roman cross? And then we'll look at what was Jesus' death look like and what does it all mean? Starting with how did Jesus end up dying on a Roman cross? Well, first of all, we need to understand that Jesus did not die on a Roman cross because he was in a long line of people throughout history who died for a worthy cause. That's not why he died on a Roman cross. We need to also understand that it was not because Jesus bravely went against the flow, and that's why he died on the Roman cross, or or he was a victim in a corrupt system. No, none of those are true. Jesus died on the cross because that was God's plan to save the world. Matter of fact, I like to look at it this way. Jesus' death on the cross was not something done to him. But it was something done by him. Say that one more time. Jesus' death on the cross was not something done to him. It was something done by him. No one took Jesus' life. No one took Jesus' life. Jesus gave his life. He said this in John 10, 18. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. Jesus laid down his life. No one forced him to the cross. He wasn't a victim. At any moment, he could have called down a legion of angels to stop it and bring everybody to their knees. He wasn't a victim. He chose the cross in accordance to God's will. He gave his life. He allowed the soldiers to beat him. And to nail him to the cross. He allowed that. 
Jesus' death was a necessary part, in fact, the core part of God's plan before the earth was spoken into existence. The cross wasn't plan B. Oh, everything fell apart, so, oh, go ahead and die, Jesus. No, it was from the beginning was God's plan. Revelation 13, 8 says this, Jesus Christ was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That doesn't mean that Jesus died before the foundation of the world. It meant that was the plan from the beginning. God's plan to redeem us, save us, from the, before the foundations of the world was Jesus, the lamb, slain. Apostle Peter said this at the day of, on the day of Pentecost, and he was preaching the good news of Jesus to the Jews who, who were apart and saw Jesus crucified. They were there, and he said this on the day of Pentecost, the beginning of the church. He said, Jesus was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. This was God's plan. And he goes on to say, you Jews nailed him to a cross he was nailed to the cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. And even Matthew in his gospel, we've seen multiple times, Jesus even said what was going to happen. He predicted what was going to take place because Jesus laid down his life in accordance with God's will. One of those examples where Jesus told his disciples what would happen took place a week before the cross. Matthew 20, 18 through 19 says this, Jesus speaks of himself. The son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will turn him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. This is before it happened. Jesus was in control. Jesus was fulfilling God's plan no one took his life. He gave his life. He died on purpose. No one forced him. No soldier dragged him there. Jesus' death was no accident. It was God's plan all along. And so we need to answer the question, how did Jesus get on a Roman cross and die? Jesus chose. He willingly went as a part of God's plan. That is how he ended up on a Roman cross 2,000 years ago. The second thing, and this is going to be hard for some of you to hear, because this is going to capture some of the details of the cross. You see, we are very distant from this cruel, cruel execution. We're very distant from this. When the gospel writers... When they wrote this, they knew. They knew what Jesus endured physically. And so for us to be able to live always in response, always live in the shadow of the cross, we need to understand what Jesus endured physically. And so we're going to look at the second question. What was Jesus' death like? What was his death like? What was it like for Jesus to die on that cross? What kind of death was the result of a crucifixion? Well, in his book, Jesus of Nazareth, Joseph Klossner, a Jewish scholar and author, wrote this. Crucifixion is the most terrible and cruel death which man has ever devised for taking vengeance on his fellow man. The most terrible and cruel death which man has ever devised for taking vengeance on his fellow man. Now the Romans didn't start the crucifixion, but they perfected it. They knew how to bring a man to the greatest measure of pain and humiliation and prolong it even over several days. They perfected this horrible horrible death. And they shared the opinion that it was a cruel death to the point that it was illegal for a Roman citizen to be put on a cross. That's how much they knew it was wrong and it was saved for their enemies. Criminals. 
And that is where Jesus died for us. Now, this is not just some story someone made up. This is historical fact, people. Okay? This is historical fact that Jesus died on the cross, on a Roman's cross designed to maximize the pain and humiliation for a condemned man. But what we understand in Scripture, specifically here in Matthew's account, is that the pain didn't start at the cross. Does anybody know where this horrible execution process started? It started with the flogging. It started with Jesus being beaten, but more specifically, as Scripture reveals, Matthew 27, verse 26, after Jesus was scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. Before he ever got to the cross, before he ever carried the cross, before he was ever nailed to the cross, he was scourged. Now, what's that, what does that mean? Well, let me explain. Scourging was... When they used a whip called a scourge or a flagrum. And it had leather straps and small pieces of metal or bone. Now I know this is, this is hard to hear, but we have to understand. We get so comfortable and so distant of what Jesus endured for us. But to understand that the whole point of why the Romans would do this is to rip the flesh Historians said that, his, that their flesh, for someone who was scourged, that their flesh looked like strips of ribbon. That's not even talking about what it would do to the muscles, to the tendons. And so completely exposed and raw. And Jesus endured that. Now, the centurion that was overseeing the scourging had to be careful because if they were, if they were not careful... The condemned man would bleed to death. See, they were just preparing them for the cross. And then they had to carry the cross. And then they were laid upon the cross. And this is not a smoothed out piece of wood. It didn't have finish on it. No, this was a rough, splintered, and your back is like strips of ribbon laid upon it. Then the part that I can't even imagine. Estimated nine inch thick nails were droven. Now some say hands, but that Greek word actually represents really from your elbow down. And many historians believe that it went through the wrist. Because to hang them on the cross would have ripped right through the hands. Nailed his wrist to the cross. And then his feet, his feet were nailed to the cross. But to me, the worst part, the worst part is actually what killed them. They were not killed by the nails. They were not killed by the beating unless they bled to death. But most times they died of suffocation. They couldn't breathe. And so to... To take a breath, they had to bend down. Again, all weight upon their wrist. They had to bend down and take a breath. And then to exhale, they had to raise up with their feet. Just to be able to release their cavity so they could exhale. That's many times what killed them. Is that they weren't able to breathe and hear Jesus was on the cross for three hours. And Jesus even spoke. I can't even imagine being able to breathe, let alone speak. And we see that Jesus looked out upon those who had mocked him, spit upon him. And Jesus said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Now, this isn't easy to hear. 
But we cannot become so distant and so numb that we forget what Jesus endured for us. And Isaiah says, by his wounds, the actual Hebrew word is stripes, we are healed. Jesus endured all of that so we could have true freedom. Much more than what a nation can offer. And I love America, but I'm telling you, true freedom is in Jesus Christ. And he took this for us. But what I believe, though, is the greatest measure of suffering was not even the physical. And and you're probably thinking, how in the world could there be a greater suffering than physically being nailed to a cross? The greatest suffering, I believe, was the spiritual suffering, which is what answers the question, what does all of this mean? Was it just Jesus going through the physical pain that brought us forgiveness? Well, I believe the answer is more than that. Why did he have to die like that? I believe that answer starts by going back the day before in the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Luke records the following, saying Jesus withdraw about, withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. So he invited Peter, James, and John to come with him. And they, as we saw last week, they kept on falling asleep. And Jesus withdrew from them and was praying. He said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Why such agony and pain? Well, some people go, he knew what was going to happen. He knew how he was going to endure that scourging. He knew that he was going to have to have a crown of thorns thrust upon his head and nailed to a cross. I do not believe that is the cup that he was referring to. There was a spiritual agony that Jesus was enduring. And that's where... I think we see in verse 42 where he says, Father, if you're willing, take this cup. Again, he's not referring to the beating. He's not referring to the nails or the crown of thorns. The cup that Jesus is referring to is Isaiah 51, 22. Isaiah 51, 22, where it says, This is what your sovereign Lord says, your God who defends his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of, that made you stagger. From that cup, the goblet of wrath, you will never drink again. Why Jesus was in such agony and sweating drops of blood in the garden the night before is because he knew he had to take the full measure of God's wrath against sin. You see, God is holy. God is just. God must punish sin. And so we wouldn't have to experience that punishment, experience that wrath. Jesus took it on the cross. It was not just the pain in the, in the torture that he was anticipating, but it was the full wrath of God being poured out upon him. You see, on the cross, Jesus would once and for all conquer sin for us. On the cross, Jesus would take our sin upon himself as a perfect sacrifice, canceling the penalty that we deserve. That's what Paul reveals. Jesus, who was without sin, took our sin upon himself to cancel the penalty. In 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 21, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Praise God, that is us. We are forgiven. We are redeemed. God's not counting our sins against us because God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin. Another translation says, he who had no sin became sin for us, which means our sin was placed upon Jesus on the cross. 
He was without sin. It was our sin that was upon him. And because of that, we were made right with God. But also in that holy moment on the cross, Jesus not only took our sins and canceled them, but Jesus took the wrath and justice we deserved. And in that moment, that's why Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He took all of the weight of sin and the wrath of God in that moment and cried out, It is finished. The penalty of sin was finished. The control that sin and death had over us. Jesus satisfied God's wrath and redeemed all who would believe in him on the cross. That's what the cross means. That's what the cross means. That's why to live our life in the shadow of the cross means we live our life in what Jesus alone could only do for us. Forgave us of our sins, satisfied the wrath of God, and redeemed us. The Apostle Paul put it this way in Romans 5, 9 through 10. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? We've been saved. God is holy and his wrath must fall upon sin. And Jesus took that wrath and we've been saved. And going on what Paul says, For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? That's why the cross is the greatest event in history. Because it's what changed. It changed our course, which was death and separation from God. And it changed us to now being saved, redeemed, loved, forgiven, because Jesus took what we deserved and gave us what he deserved, which was a rightful place with God. I'd like to close with this. I know this is a lot. I mean, you're going to walk out going, whoa, it's a lot. But if we believe in Jesus, we have to understand what Jesus did for us. And boy, we have to live again in the reality and in the victory of what he's done. I'd like to close with this verse. 1 John 4, 10. And this is love. How much did God love us? Well, first of all, we couldn't love God. It's not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now that word propitiation is, I never say it right, I get too much of a lisp in it. But propitiation, what it means is, it means wrath absorbing sacrifice. If you want to know what the cross means to the sinner and to the saved, it means that Jesus absorbed the wrath of God so we could be free. We could be free. Propitiation, wrath-absorbing sacrifice. I'd like to close with this story that kind of puts it in a different context. Story of a four-year-old by the name of Cecilia. 1987, she was the only survivor of a plane crash. 155 people died in this plane crash. And she was in such good condition that the rescuers and the responders even questioned if she was on the plane, but they checked the passenger list and she was definitely on the plane. How did she survive? Cecilia survived because her mother unbuckled her seatbelt right before the impact, knelt in front of her daughter, wrapped her arms around her, taking the full force of the impact. That is a picture of what Jesus did for us on the cross. He wrapped his arms around all humanity and took the full force so we could live.
No greater love than this. No greater love than this. Propitiation. Wrath-absorbing sacrifice. That's what the cross means. That's why we celebrate Christ's death every Sunday. But as we're going to see next week, we cannot celebrate his death without celebrating his what? Resurrection. His resurrection. Jesus died so we could have life. He wrapped his life around us so that we could be saved. And then he came back to life, offering us life eternally. And praise God, we not only remember his death and his resurrection, but we look for his return. That is Jesus. That is the power of the cross. May we live in that freedom every single day.